Welcome back to another episode of HBCU Digest, Digest After Dark on Sirius XM Radio, channel 142 HBCU, the pride of Howard University Radio. I am your hostess, Tiffany, and clearly I am forever permanently on the road and Jared is not here with us tonight. Um, today, tonight, we have Orison Morganite, Midnight Winston, getting them into school, just changed to the Dell State Pipeline. I'm trying to catch up here. And uh, Laurel the Aggie, we may or may not hear from <clears throat> KD and Eric. We will see how that goes. But tonight, we are, um, with the exception of one topic, are very Florida heavy tonight. I didn't design it like that, but that's how it's going to play out. Um, so first up is Nicole Hannah Jones in particular. Um, it was announced a few days ago that she and my uh, fellow Howard alum, Tiny Heasy Coates, would be um, on faculty at Howard uh, in this coming academic year. If you will recall, uh, if you were or are a longtime listener, you will know that um, this past May, we talked about Nicole Hannah Jones and other Black scholars who have been denied <clears throat> tenure at their traditionally white institutions and systems. And here we see, you know, some moves were made. And, and the only thing that I could think of is A, that while we were chatting, um, it would seem that. President Frederick was negotiating to make things happen. Um, second thing I would also say, as I have been cackling since I read the announcement, is um, something that Big Sean said in, in Friday Night Cypher. Shit be impossible until it happens, right? Um, so that's all I got. Laurel, it's on you for this. Um Please give us a prophetic word, um, a response, anything else you have to say. I mean, this happening was the prophetic word, was it not? Did I not say that this was going to happen? <laughs> Did I not say? Was I lying? I wasn't. Um, yeah, definitely scoop this. My sources will remain unnamed, um, but people be knowing. Um, I think it's not so much as her, like, of course she wasn't gonna stay at UNC. She would be a fool if she did, because how do you let people play in your face publicly? And then they say, oh, just kidding, never mind, here you go. And then you take it, like, she was never gonna do that. She's She's been through the tray too long in these journalism streets to do that. But like I said last time, her, I remember her saying, Howard came to her. They were the only HBCU that said, hey there, you and all your wonderful, glorious funding, we have a space for you. Would you like to have a seat? And she said, yes. And what did I say last time? That other scholars that are black, we will even expand it to the rest of the people of color I would take it further and say, don't wait to be asked. Show up and say, how can I help you? Oh, I see you have this, but it could be better. Here are my resources and my grant funding and old white people money. That is in the millions. What do you need? Winston, what you got? Uh, you know, first thing is uh, welcome home. Welcome home to to the to the folk. However, you needed to have your awakening, uh, whatever required you to recognize the opportunity. Welcome home, um, you know. And uh, opportunity is uh, is there. I think there's a lot of opportunity, um, you know, from a sector wide perspective for folks to have the spotlight uh, shined upon the value in our institutions and what they can bring. Um, and, and to Laurel's point, what you can what what some of those educated minds and resources can bring to the sector as well. Um, 
you know, I hope that the opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me, allows, uh, you know, the attention that it deserves. Um, you know, some people require the, the fancy names and, you know, and the, and the certain influencers to be a part of the sector in order to recognize them. But that doesn't mean you won't catch some people who um, will find deep value um, and who maybe do understand uh, purpose in this space, what it means to be called to the space, to Dr. Carr's uh, point. Um, and I hope it just is an opportunity that that is that is taken by others who understand it and that it doesn't require you to in Laurel to get played in your face in order for you to understand the value there. You know, hopefully it, it allows some other folks to reevaluate um, their careers, um, really take a let take a unbiased um, look at the sector um, and what opportunities are there um, for us as uh, collectively as a culture. Um, to be able to use those minds and those resources in the HBCU space, because there is a lot of value there. We know it's rich and, and valuable. Solid ores. So I just want to, I think I've seen a lot of commentary from people saying, you know, oh, she went to Howard and there's a, a certain bias towards Howard um, due to its location and its um, brand. <clears throat> but she's paying her own salary. So she really could have went anywhere she wanted to and she chose Howard. So I know she said like Howard reached out, Howard offered, but she's paying her own way. She's actually bringing more resources than Howard can actually give. So I thought it was, I thought it was cool to see that because she could have done something different. I thought it was cool that she came with, with Ty. And I thought that in general, it brings a lot of good energy to the sector. I hope that in general, her time there is, is good um, because it is a tenured role. She can stay for as long as she would like to. And I'm assuming she'll be in and out over the next, you know, 20, 30 years, um, probably doing assignments with New York Times Magazine, doing stuff at Howard, maybe do some film stuff like Tynisi does coming back. And um, I think it's cool to, uh, to see that. More to Laurel's point. Can y'all hear that thunder? We're not even supposed to be doing this right now, but we're going to continue. Um, more to Laurel's point, it is it is a calling. Um, but I, the conflicted part of me also says that the calling can't be enough. The calling can't be enough. And we're also, you know, working to get to that point where we can get out of, get out of, a survival mode, right? We need to get to the point where all of us or the majority of us are thriving um, on our individual campuses and collectively. Um, so that's that's something to, I think, think about. KD, <clears throat> you can round it out. Sure. Um, I'll err on the side of positivity and just say that, you know, Howard is a powerhouse in the HBCU community for a ton of reasons. Um, and, we, and we understand that. So we understand that they'll always be able to, to attract the celebrity. And I'm thankful that the celebrity decided to come home and be with people that's going to love her. And she brought her money with her, which is dope as well, right? So she's not going to put any stress on a university, build the university's profile, and then prayfully build some other um, Black, strong, young journalists underneath of her to follow in her footsteps and do some similar work and, you know, bring more light to the sector. But just because Howard is the powerhouse and they can attract the celebrity doesn't mean that, you know, the uh, the Fort Valleys, the Fists, the, uh, the, I don't know, the Johnson C. Smiths, the Coppin State Universities, the smaller HBCUs without the strong, strong, strong alumni can't, you know, take their best and, and build in their universities. You don't need a celebrity to do something new, do something fresh and well, not even new or fresh, just to build a program in a way that attracts people you just need to take your best alumni and, and do something similar right you don't need a celebrity to do this you just need to do it with what you got i assure you that there's a successful black um philanthropist or philosopher a successful black journalist a successful black whatever coming out of your school that you just need to highlight bring them home <laughs> not roller martin and fist <laughs> that you just need to highlight Bring them home. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny that it should be. <laughs> I hate y'all. Stupid chat. I'm um, you know, you highlight them, bring them home, and build around them. You know, 
you know, help build their profile in the midst of you building their profile, help build your school's profile and move like that. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But again, I'm just happy. I'm happy she came home. And then they hit him with the double whammy and brought home one of their own, too. That's big ups to Howard, man. Y'all, y'all just keep making the right moves at the right time. Um, so yeah, congratulations, y'all. Again, for the for the continued wins. I have right. to say, um, wait, are you done, KD? Yeah, I'm, done. I'm done. Okay. I have to say that um an HBCU president texted me and he was like, This is a win for Howard. I said, nah, this is a win for everybody. Everybody is on, right? Um and I say that because the top, <clears throat> the top programs or the schools at Howard, the professional and, gra- and the graduate school all have, or the majority of them have summer programs that are specifically for HBCU students, not just Howard students, but HBCU students. So I would um, expect to see something come of Nicole Hannah Jones and Ta-Nehisi Coates being added to that that line of summer programming um, for for other HBCU students. Um, that's something that I, I do really expect to see. Um, but moving on to the first Florida topic, um, I suppose we'll we'll let Ors have this first. Um, so if you have been following the saga for a while, you will know that Bethune-Cookman University um, a few years ago struck this residential residence hall deal. And it didn't make sense to a lot of different people. It didn't make sense to a lot of different people. Um, it was just like, who cleared this? Nobody would, you know, take the responsibility for, hey, I, I cleared this. I mean, obviously we know who did, but, you know, it just did not, it didn't sit well with a lot of different people. Um, there have been, since this time, various stories about mismanagement deals being brokered, people getting kickbacks, all these different things. Um, but a few days ago, there was, um, an announcement made that essentially the debt has been um, relieved um, through the federal government. And now it's the question is being asked, you know, is Bethune-Cookman University in the clear? Is it safe? Um, things like this, for the amount of money, it was like $306 million um, that, that, um, that's being uh, given, relieved, whatever the case is. And the one of the things from the article talked about how for a debt that large, a sum of money that must be paid, those things start to affect your accreditation. And so um, the idea is that with this debt being relieved, that they're safe from getting their accreditation snatched. By SAC CLC. And so, um, Ors, as somebody, I think you obviously were a Rattler for a year. I would assume you have much to say. I know you also have. Two and, years. Oh, excuse me, two years. Um, I know, I think you, you also have an interest in real estate. So, you got this first. You're up. Thank you, Tiffany. So, what I would say first is they're not the hot seat. Their AD just resigned. Their president just resigned. So it's kind of difficult to be excited about things when you have a major people in the administration who are resigning after the AD was there, for, I think, for 17 years. And he did a very good job. They have great athletics, um, wonderful uniforms. Um, but with the president leaving after all the controversy, there's still some board issues. With with the resolution of the debt, that's good. But one thing one people realize is that the original deal was worth around $100, $150 million. And it had already played so much interest that it was worth over $300 million in debt in five or six years. So it just shows you how bad of a deal they signed. 
Um, I hope that they can transform um, from an administration standpoint, uh, get the board together. But it's a it's it's still a rickety ship. Like they plugged a hole, but um, it, it's not it's it's not not fixed. They still need a president. They still need an athletic director. He, the president took people with him to still positions that are open. Enrollment is not great. Um, and unfortunately, the state, which is giving them a lot of money, is right now in a tax deficit because they didn't get hospitality tax. So the extra money they had for um, private schools are not given out this year to, to be to, Bethune, to Stetson, um, to some other private schools in the state, state of Florida. So I'm not overly optimistic about Bethune Cookman College. Um and I hope that they can continue to um to get their stuff together. But this debt is nice to get off, but you need a president. Like you need a president. Like you had like four interims in the last like five years. They've had different board chairs, different board members. It's a it's a mess, and they have all these new calls coming to the slack. So I don't know, I don't know. And I just say to cook for college. I was on purpose. Yes, we got that. Um, so now I'm wondering, how do we decide? Nah, I say that. Okay. <clears throat> Where did ORs go? All right. Um, let's go with Eric. Okay. How how do we decide what exactly? No, no, no. I, 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 I wait. I, no, no, no. I I'll wait for that question. At some point, you know, you know, Bethune Cookman is is private. So it's it's a it's a whole lot of people you got to ask who's responsible here for, even though we, we know, but we also don't know. I can't help but to ask, like, as was all, as with things I've said in previous episodes of, you know, Dynasty of the Dark, who, who's holding the board accountable? Because this all, all goes back to the board one way or the next. And it took that just handled. Hello? But they in the swag though, so I guess it's all good to them. We'll see. One of the questions in the article was along the lines of, so they couldn't do this with any of the presidents before? Like, was this not on the table as a solution with none of the, the previous presidents? None, not this was not on the table. And I just I find that hard to believe when I think about. <laughs> that one, I'm seeing the graduation in my head where Betsy DeVos was down there talking. Was this not on the table? Because this was this was a thing then. Who knows? KD? I mean, I can't speak to what happened during that admin. I re vehemently rejected everything that they did. Not everything, but almost everything that they did, right? So I'm not even going to put that into play. But what I will say is when and this is a cause for concern for me. When you see a large sum of money being given to an institution, an incredibly large sum of money being given to an institution, when you see a lot of leadership turnover, it begs the question, <laughs> who's interested in the school? Why are they interested? And what is your plan to keep them from acquiring the school? I, that's especially, and we said we're in Florida, right? You know, they don't they don't want them HBCUs down there, especially in Daytona <laughs> around them good around a certain demographic. So, yeah, um, I would I would be concerned if I'm alumni that you may lose this institution to the closest. Uh, for profit PWI, not for profit, but the closest state institution that's a PWI or MSI, whatever, however you want to slice it <clears throat> um, in the area. That's the only way I can see it, because when you talk about quarter Billy plus a quarter Billy plus to save a school, um, did you even solve the problem from when you uh, 
took the first 108 million is that problem still in, in existence and then you had the nerve to take more money like how do you how do you triple that number <laughs> in in under four years how do you triple that number you know like i i think that school is going to get snatched we may lose that hbcu because of foolishness unfortunately i, I hope i'm wrong I hope I'm wrong. I've been wrong before, um, but I, I can't see it any other way right now because it's just too much money for a state or federal government just to let that school just sit there and be cool. You know what I mean? That's, that's all I got. I don't want to see that. I literally don't want to see that. Like, that would make me want to fight. And I know we do not. Oh no, Jared ain't here. We don't, we don't talk about, or Jared does not talk about Morris Brown College. But if we had, and it sounds very terrible, but if we had to pick a school, pick between the two. Oh heck no, we're not doing that. Mm -mm. I want to know. I mean, I was going to bring them up, but only to say that if Morris Brown can have 29 lives, why not can Bethune Cookman? Oh, and to correct orders, they actually did just get a new AD as of this week. But to that point, though, Georgia has a much stronger uh, school, you know, uh, college or higher education institution. I would, I believe. That's, right? that's it. They're a little more it. closer. That, that's the Florida, big one. Florida and Georgia <laughs> fighting for last place. Like, <sighs> ah, Florida and Georgia were supposed to be separated from the United States and be drifting in the Gulf right now, but they're not. Especially so Florida. while they're still connected, we have to deal with everything. I'll, I'll, save, Atlanta. Atlanta. <laughs> I'll save Atlanta. I'll save Atlanta for the sake of. <laughs> nope. Nope, they gotta Atlanta, go too. Atlanta can go too. They gotta go. <laughs> Why y'all okay. so funny? Atlanta, oh Atlanta can be Atlantis. Okay, that's oh that's God. the spot too. But for oh a while, they're still connected. Even, I, I ain't I even mean, know what are they. I'm saying there will be when it 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 separates <laughs> from the U.S. and it, it drifts out to the Atlantic Ocean, perhaps the Bermuda Triangle. Who knows? You know what I'm saying? Other worlds. But I feel like Bethune Cookman. I don't know. I don't think anyone should, you know, burn whatever brain cells they have to worry about how they finagled this deal. I do agree with KD that there is something else afoot because there's always something afoot, and with, especially with a private institution, there's 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 a few foots afoot. Um, but I feel like in the meantime, they're stabilizing, so it's kind of hard to say like, okay, is this gonna? Are they really gonna improve from this, or is this just? The setup before another pitfall. We don't know. I, I wish, I wish, I wish all schools were required to pub, make their like make their books public. I wish all nonprofits were required to do that. And that's unfair, and that's problematic for them. even when they are public, people still don't look at it, Eric. This is true, but if it was there, there there are the Jareds of the world. <laughs> there are the people of the world who no. work in higher education. They're like, what the heck is going on here? Thank because you. somebody's. It, it, it is. It, it, you're right. Thank I you. ain't gonna lie to you. I was you're at right. A and T, and while people were complaining about the budget, I even told people, I was like, "You can literally," and I did it. Full disclosure, I looked up every last one of my professor's salary. But mm -hmm. does the average? I know the average student doesn't know that because it's easier to complain about the financial aid office, which valid, but. No one's gonna really sit there and look at uni university budget. Know what that means. See, they'll just see the numbers and like, why is why is all my tuition going to athletics? Which it doesn't, but whatever. But I think I don't know. It's hard to tell. But also, it's it's Florida. Florida is going to be, you know, six months from now, Florida might be on fire. Uh, this might not even matter. Fam. The question, the question ultimately is, which Florida man is it? You know, it's like it's like you know the the Johnny Appleseed of the South, right? Like, <laughs> it's like what headline is it for 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 BCU? But like I asked y'all, I said in the chat, like if you were FAMU, how much would you pay for BCU just to be petty? 
But Come if you on. put it over the kids, I wouldn't. They ain't got that money. If I'm fam, you, I wouldn't reach that. Hold up. Y'all out of order. Y'all out of order. Y'all out of order. There's already a question on the floor that none of y'all have answered. What is the question? If we had to choose. Oh, nobody's answering that question. Oh, that is that's not that's not it. That's wait, how is that? You know we're not which, answering which, that question. No, I think both did. It's it's easy. Which one is still still which one actually has had accreditation for the last oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, oh between between um <laughs> mm, I don't even want to say their name. It's like saying Beetlejuice. Right. Um, <laughs> I love that movie. But right. the <laughs> the organization of buildings that may or may not be a school. Um, would I pick them? No. Um, I would pick them the same way I would pick ICDC College, another institution that also no longer exists. Um, so there you go. That's my answer. Worth saving. So you, so, you, so you said BC. Katie, so you're saying BC Fanny Law School, have, right? uh, Atlanta. So Fanny's already out there. Fan so you want, there. So what you're saying, Laurel, is that you want to have BCU doing commercials courtesy of Lil Romeo? To advertise people no, to what I'm saying oh. is if Little Romeo and Master P could not save a for-profit college from closing, none of the grifting and scamming and dream selling is going to save Morris Brown, just like it will not say, save Bethune Cookman. God rest Mary McLeod Bethune's soul. That is my shero. She's turning in her grave right now. I'm so sorry, sis. I'm so sorry. sorry. I'm just saying it's a She's been turning about five, ten years now. All I'm saying is a Florida man waiting to take Bethune Cookman and turn it into Florida State University. It'll be UCF first. Okay. UCF closing. All right. I'll take that. <laughs> UCF Daytona. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take this it. Is, this, is, this is going to take us into our third. And actually, there's a quote from this article that is that applies to Cookman. It applies to Morris Brown, and it applies to Florida Memorial University. Calvary. And it's like, damn. Typically, I don't like to agree with, um, or it, it just bothers me that uh, there could be some people who are not of the community who write about us, and it's just so. It's like, damn, I don't want to agree, but he's speaking the truth. But um, so let me back up. <clears throat> Florida Memorial University is in trouble. And in the last, this is from a few days ago, essentially updated yesterday. Um, this article is first sentence is the time has come for an intervention. So my God. Yeah, and then it outlines all the problems that uh, Florida Memorial is facing currently. Um, the 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 first of it is that the school is has recently been placed on accreditation probation, and I mean I know we've talked about the ins and outs of how we understand and how others of our community understand uh accreditation and how serious it is to be on probation to have your accreditation revoked to not have it but still be open um we know what that looks like that's not there's no mystery there you know what that looks like we all know what that looks like um and so earlier you heard me cut myself off um but i was i was going to say like at what point do we decide that we're not uh, what HBCUs we're not going to save? What HBCUs that if you like, why why are we getting so close to the flame? Why are we sticking our hand in the oven like the stove ain't hot? Like fire don't burn. Like like fat meat is not easy like why do we have to get to this point like is it is it adrenaline is it the rush does it make you feel alive like why do we do this why do we allow it to happen why do we spend time 
And this is a point from this is a point from the article that definitely applies to Morris Brown. I don't think it applies so much to, to Cookman, but obviously it also applies to uh, Florida Memorial. And it says, a slick new recruitment video on the homepage of fmuniv.edu is high on spirit and low on substance. Appealing to students interested in sports, fraternities, and sororities, and the school's proximity to South Beach. And I said, mm -hmm. but earlier in the article, it talked about how, you know, it's on accreditation probation. And one of the ways that it has to prove itself as, you know, a viable institution is to have higher student enrollment. Is this is this the formula to get higher student enrollment? Can't we see how that's worked out at Morris Brown College? Doing all those things? Where, is, where are the numbers? I don't know. Didn't we say we wasn't fitting to mention them no more? Hey, no, that's we nice. didn't. Three times. But so I would, I would ask of all of you, um, you know, like, what do we do? Well, what, what, what do we do? Should this, should this be the last time we have to address an institution like this? Like, at some point, we have to say, I can't continue to give my energy to an institution that is repeatedly so close to being up out of here. Like, um, and so, I mean, I don't like that I even think that, but I think it, but I don't like that I think it. I don't. All right, so, <laughs> well, check me out. So at the beginning of the pandemic, right, we were plus minus on how many HBCUs we thought we would lose in general uh, for a ton of reasons. Most of which was because instead of focusing on, like we said, student enrollment, academic programming, maybe reshuffling your finances and doing all types of logistical reorganization such that you could have a thriving institution coming out of this, they were focused on branding for the most part across the sector. Everybody just chose branding. And then because of the influx of money we got um, due to the uh, protests, mostly we thought, hey, this is a sustainable formula. And we'll keep getting this money because we'll keep seeing HBCUs highlighted um, in this space, right? That's one side of it. And then the other side of it is clearly Florida is sick of the black colleges and they're going to take out as many of them as they can while Gavin Newsom has some time in office because his time is probably limited at this point because they're sick of him as well. So he's going to scorch earth this thing um, as for as long as he has that seat. So you got those two things at play. One, we as a sector didn't necessarily do right by the sector um, from a logistical standpoint. We didn't buffer any or very few of us did anything to buffer our programming in a way that would suggest more students want to come um, and that we're building programs that will be usable in the future. Right. We didn't I, I didn't see we didn't see a lot of colleges talk about STEM and all of the STEM related stuff. You didn't see a lot of colleges talk about um, any of the social, at least not from a um, major, you know, however you want to frame it in a way that is academic, academic perspective. You didn't see a lot of colleges talking about that or advertising that aspect of their school. And I think you're seeing the fallout of it, the early signs of it, because enrollment was down in general across the country. Colleges were not enrolling as many students, largely because we all broke. But, you know, college enrollment was down. So if it's down to PWIs, it's even worse at HBCUs, right? And so we're just not dealing with that in a very real way. And so when you say, then you bring up all of the schools or the schools that continues to ha continue to have accreditation issues, this is probably part of the problem. This is probably part of the problem. Um, you're not bringing in a great student. And on top of that, you're not cultivating that student that you do have to be successful. And then you're wondering why your GPA slips from 2.7 to 2.5 to 1.9 and why nobody wants to continue to fund a university that isn't graduating students. I mean, I, I think that we shouldn't 
we shouldn't be uh, struggling to connect those dots, in my opinion. The point in this article that is um, that that applies to to Cookman, to Morris Brown, and obviously the Florida Memorial is more transparency is needed, not more secrecy. For mm -hmm. FMU to survive and thrive, a major house cleaning is in order. Yeah. And I said, mm, you're right. Scorch it and start again. And it and then it ends with when your house is on fire and the flames are shooting through the roof. You can't put it out. You can't put out the blaze with a fire extinguisher in the kitchen. Mm. I said, yeah. Right about it. Laurel. <clears throat> I think they're gonna probably have to do not in the same way, but do the same thing that Bennett did. Obviously, you can't only, and FMU is not the only school that does this. It's just, it ends up in the news because we're black. Um, but a lot of schools in higher ed have, you know, trying to be a Marriott and trying to, oh, look at all our amenities and we have a campus concierge and all of the stuff, which some are extra, some actually is part of student affairs. It colors your college experience. You're not gonna get a degree in chilling. You're going to get a degree in whatever majors are available. And so I think FMU has to redirect. I think they need to look in their own backyard. They might have to put more effort toward reaching pre-college population, non-traditional students. Maybe somehow, by the grace of God, boost up their digital infrastructure to offer more online programs. Because if they go toward access, and they actually get good at it, they'll be better than their peers that have a lot more money, but only think about, you know, the traditional age student because the largest population of students growing beyond Hispanic students overall is not traditional students or the adult learner. And so they know they're not a community college, but I feel like if they approach it that way, one, they'll save themselves money. Two, you can still have some of those like traditional four year college features, but you don't have to necessarily have like the CVS receipt of features. You can do what you do best. They have an aviation program. How many schools have aviation programs? Like, one comes to mind. so it's like you have some diamonds that are a little bit tarnished, they just need some polish. You're chasing stuff that you don't. What's that? What's that? Um, Jennifer Hudson meme? Insufficient funds. You ain't got no money. You don't have any money, and you're about to lose your accreditation. So, you need to look in your pocket, move the lint out the way. Oh, I got one last good quarter. Let me shine the shit out of that joint. Pop it in. I know that's easier said than done. I just think. You know, obviously beyond mismanagement, again, it's going to take someone else who wants to bake the bread <laughs> and is willing to put in the elbow grease and say, OK, let's start small. Let's work with what we have. Like, Lowell hit it on the head. They need to contact their alumni like their alumni. And that goes back to HBCUs and having a bad history, but except for they had that many years recently. It's a no, small school. Even, they don't have that many people to call even, and have and have them probably on social security. This income. Oh, uh, that's that's not even right, though. I listen, I got I had a co-worker that was the Florida Memorial. It would surprise me too. And he was younger than me, but it happened recently. <laughs> but that's not the point. The point, the point is uh, you have to lean into the network you have immediate access to first. You ain't going Kodak Black is not walking through that door. Trina is not walking through that door. Like they, they're not coming through to to help. And honestly, and maybe it's me, the one thing that I hate worse than a politician pandering to a particular group of people in order to get their support are HBCUs pandering to the culture by highlighting aspects of what they believe makes them an HBCU that we see PWIs consistently copying their students saying, oh, we're like an HBCU also. Thanks, Florida Memorial, for going ahead and supporting that stereotype when our schools are a lot more. But that's not even the point right now. Yeah. Winston, hit me. 
So here's the thing, man. For starters, I'm not overly enthused by this article. Um, and you you touched on it from the jump. But sometimes when folks are writing from it outside of the sector, it's a little bit different. The taste is a little bit different. Um, what I would say is, you know, I think you got to keep everything in context. What's already been mentioned, you know, the part that my mentees who've been who've gone to Florida Memorial found out is it ain't right around the corner from from uh, South Beach, despite what uh, what you might understand. And we do know that there's, to Laurel's point, some money issues that are, that do exist for FloMo. But the other underarching obvious thing that's not been said yet or mentioned is we're in a panini. So despite what our cousins' travel plans may look like, we're still in a pandemic. So mm-hmm. this new president that they've had, who's been there for about almost three years now, is still navigating his transition in the midst of a Panera Bread and trying to figure out what makes sense in order to get students to his institution. I think the brother deserves some grace in that space um, and the time to to, to build. Uh, what's my uh, you know final uh, Clark artist who was there before him who did a solid job? It wasn't a barren situation that he was that he inherited when he got there. I think he deserves the time to uh, figure out what's going on there. And then shout out to my Detroit brother Jason Horn who just took over uh, athletic director there. Um, you know, trying to get some things together in that space as well. I think in general a larger issue that we have, which kind of was just mentioned about our uh, recruitment to our institutions kind of belittling to Eric's point of, you know, like the only thing we got is the turn up and homecoming and that there's so much more to, to what we have to offer. So I think, I think that there's still time to, to course correct the situation at Flum. I don't think it's dire. We also know that we talked about before accreditation is a process. So they're on probation. It doesn't mean that they will get their accreditation. Take. We know it's an issue when you talk about trying to recruit students there. I know far too often trying to have those conversations with parents when that's on the table. But it does not mean that they will lose accreditation necessarily, um, especially if how well the president navigates the transition of this pandemic and figuring things out, uh, what have you. So um, there's other institutions like Loyola in New Orleans. They were in a similar situation to this, having money problems on you know accreditation probation, and they were able to turn it around in a, in a, in a similar comparison. Cause you talk about new Orleans compared to, you know, 45 minutes from, from South beach. Um, so I think there's opportunity here. I don't think it's dire straight. I don't think it's like, Oh my God, they're comparing it to an institution that got signed a contract with a hotel recently or whatever the heck they did. Um, you know, I don't know that it's, it, we've gone that far to be, um, to say it's down the tubes. It's definitely cause for concern and conversation but I don't think it's out of the window to say that um, that it can be course corrected and there's still opportunity to do so. Um, you know, and like I said, we got I got one student who's still there um, who should be graduating in a year or two. So I'm, I'm definitely leaning on hope that it uh, that it's able to course correct um, given time and, and leadership doing the things that they need to do. That what's been what's been mentioned before, things that can be done in order to to, to course correct and, and change things. But I don't think it's as dire as the article art articulated. Um, definitely cause for concern. Definitely things need to be changed. But um, I think the, the article was kind of a little bit of the perspective of somebody who's outside of the sector, um, you know, reporting live. So um, <clears throat> before we get to our last topic, I do uh, need to say that there is a praise report out of Florida. Um, now called Edward Waters University. They have worked hard <laughs> to get to that point. I wish they were uh, some phone calls for kids I'm trying to get down there, but other than that, yeah, awesome. Dang, we'll handle that. We'll, we'll handle that. <laughs> we will handle that. Um, they really, really have worked hard to get to this, this point. Um, actually, I'm working on an article that I just need to go ahead and finish. But definitely, Everwaters College does not, it's, it's no more. It's Everwaters University. They have an accredited master's, oh, fully online, 100% online, master's of business administration program. And it's one year. They're university now. I am very proud of Everwaters University. Um, hmm. That's all I can say. The rest is going to be in the article. 
Um, <clears throat> to a more Winston, please. Um, to a more, I guess, somber type of topic. Um, two weeks ago, um, President Frederick Humphreys died. And this, I'm, I remember only because it came late in the night. So I was like, oh, yikes. Um, and so like what followed in, in, the, in the, the days after were people expressing how much he meant to them. So HBCU president expressing how much of a mentor he was and a great leader that he was. Um, as somebody who was uh, not yet born, wouldn't know, um, don't know, to see uh, people expressing what he meant to them in their uh, formation of who they are as uh, higher education, HBCU leaders, I was just like, hmm, wow. That, like that's an impactful um, life. Um, and typically I am, and this is part cynicism, but typically when I see like a lot of people coming together to talk about one person, I'm always like, hmm, is it all that glittery? Like I, I just keep that in mind because, you know, you, you never know, right? But this, I didn't, I didn't catch that at all. Um, from him and reading about what he meant to um, other, actually current HBCU presidents, uh, Dr. Glover comes to mind first. Um, so I would ask um, each of you what you feel or what you think. I'm going to start with Ors because at one point um, President Humphreys was a Rattler, so you got it. He went to Fender, so he was always a rattler. He was the yeah. student and the president. So gotta gotta give it to him. Um he was a really great man. I met him a couple times. He used to he lived in Orlando after he retired from FAM, but he used to come up quite a bit. Um I thought that, you know, I thought that he got a, the right and rightful tribute for his work and efforts. Um I think we're talking a lot about his work he did at Tennessee State a lot now. They're pushing to get their land grant funding um, because they cut it off around the time he was president. Uh, they were pushing for their land grant in Tennessee back then. Um, I think also he's a great example of we most of you we don't want to recycle presidents, but he was a recycle president and he was great at Tennessee State, but he was even greater back at FAM. Um, the only thing I think we have to remember is unfortunately his end of FAM came under some really precarious circumstances with the trying to go to the FBS and the, the issues with Billy Joe. And it's unfortunate that the state of Florida had to Florida. Um, but I think he probably should have been at FAM probably another five years. And if they hadn't gotten in the way and Florida State hadn't gotten in the way, um, FAM would be in an even better position than it is um, than it was and what it went through over those times. But, I mean, he was a great man. Nobody did. You know, the halftime chant better than him um, with his big rumbling voice. And um, he'll definitely be missed. He'll play his recording doing the halftime chant um, at band performances and stuff. Um, so he's definitely the most iconic family president ever. Um, and, he'll go in, and he'll go down as uh, FAMU's GOAT. You know, he's, he's, he's probably one of probably top five AC presidents of all time. Laurel. I'm sorry, I forgot what the question was. I got I got thrown off by the died. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just still reeling from that. So excuse me. I just <laughs> transition passed away. I literally I say died. I say dead. He passed, Tiff. He passed. <laughs> And maybe I'm the wrong person to ask to do this, but <laughs> I mean, all right. But uh, yes, Laura, do you want me to come back to you? I, I just want to know what the question was. Oh, we, we're giving our feelings about um, Frederick Humphreys. Um, I, I wouldn't know. I don't know if you knew him. I figured Ors might. 
So that's why I went with him first. But So I didn't know him, but I think it says something about anyone who has transitioned that you can, even if you don't know them personally, the best judgment you have of them is how everyone else speaks about them. And so just from what I saw, it's just like, you know, what we call an education, someone who is truly transformative, not just in what they actually did, but how they impacted so many people's lives. And I hope that we could have many more leaders um, that we can talk about that way in like the next 25, 50 years beyond one institution. Um, and I think, you know, granted, you could say the times were different, things like that. But I just think what what any one leader is able to do um, is able to transform, make a way out of no way, even when you have insufficient, insufficient funds. Um, I think that that's monumental. And so I would hope that his legacy serves as a model for current leaders, future leaders, leaders in training, students, staff, facilities management, cafeteria workers, and the outer community of how you make an impact, um, not just in the tangible, but also in the intangible through the seeds that you plant in other students. I was just about to say, like, when I did this, I was going to say, legacy. Legacy. It's legacy. All, from a pure non-emotional standpoint, that man, Dr. Humphreys, did so well at FAMU that in 1998, they were named College of the Year by Time and Princeton Review. Now, I don't want to put on a plateau uh, white-based stipulations, but we already know how schools are ranked, how that's influenced heavily by money, how that's influenced heavily by national branding. So the fact that this man in the work that he did was able to go back to his alma mater and do so well in that role, that 12 years after he took the helm, that a national publication such as Time named FAMU the best school, <laughs> the, the top school of the year, that in itself speaks to the work that he's done. Right. Winston. So uh, coming from a family that's full of uh, Tennessee State alumni and uh, teachers and because they used to funnel teachers to DPS from Tennessee State, um, you have to, uh, you know, tip your hat to what uh, with what Fred Humphreys did in his tenure. Um, for me personally, as an as an HBCU president, um, and how much it's influenced me personally, just from like I said, from educators that I've had and family members who've benefited from um, his tenure at TSU, particularly, um, and then even peers who were at uh, at FAM when he was uh, when he was there as well. Um, so you know, I think it does beg a question about you know about legacies and and what it looks like. I think as a sector. There probably needs to be more attention paid to younger women of color um, taking over those roles um, and and kind of leading the torch in the way of the transition um, into the new age of and hopefully pushing and moving our institutions into the new age um, in order for that to be successful. I think uh, black women are probably going to play a huge role and should play a huge role in that um, in those transitions positively that we hope to see, um, you know, moving forward. Um, you know, I, I am curious to those folks that are kind of being tabbed for those things and paying close attention to Texas Southern um, and their appointment, their recent appointment, um, and hoping that is a kind of like a, a beacon, of, again, of possibilities uh, going forward for the sector as a whole. But, um, and, it, and it does make you wonder, if will we see that? you know, the kind of legacies like Fred Humphrey's um, present day, um, we hope. KD. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Um, I don't have much else to offer, man. Condolences to his family, of course, praying for their peace. Um, clearly a great man, somebody I think uh, if you are sitting in a leadership position, you should probably try to emulate his formula in some way, shape, form or fashion. It does make me wonder, um, 
since we talk about we're talking about legacy like um it how when are we as a community are, are gonna are we ever gonna be allowed just to build legacies because I, I not just in higher ed but across the board it seems like every time we get a leadership position it's just taken from us just a little bit too soon or we're just a little bit too unfairly in comparison to our counterparts um and other demographics and so if you could see the impact that one man had on one school in one state um and in so many lives you know over a span of i'm guessing 20 or 30 years plus right why you know why can't we have more of what he does right that's 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 the thing that comes to mind especially again in this in this context of legacy right he loved what he was committed to um and that's always an amazing thing an amazing feeling to know that you know when you leave this earth that you that you had an impact and it was overtly positive right um, so yeah, just you know, praying for the family. That's all I got. That people will still say your name. Yeah. Um, that is going to do it for us tonight. Anybody have any last words? No more mentions of that school in Atlanta that is adjacent to a hotel <laughs> with um a football field that is actually a garden that is actually a forest that is actually a graffiti alley. Um, no such so. place exists as a collection of buildings. We and can't talk about, about Mary. We can't talk about Marriott Brown College. <laughs> that, that's gonna stick. That's gonna stick. We cannot. Mary we cannot. Brown College. We can't mention it's the Baltimore agencies. Yes. The place oh. that shall not be named. <laughs> This has been another episode of HBCU Digest, Digest After Dark on Sirius XM Radio, channel 142 HBCU, the pride of Howard University Radio. I am your hostess, Tiffany, permanently forever on the road. And we will catch you all maybe next week. Who knows? But we'll see. Um, stay safe. Good night.